Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Otem, and today, with the help of Tim Braithwaite and Lisandro Abadi, we'll talk about conducting in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. Conducting is when one person leads a group of musicians in their performance using physical gestures. Conducting as we know it today seems to follow practices that were broadly established in the 18th and early 19th centuries. In previous centuries, conductors often did different things, some sharing features with modern practices and others not at all. In this episode, dedicated to this vast subject, we will look at a selection of sources demonstrating the varied and fascinating ways musical performances were led. Let's start. In many treatises, the tactus, the beat, a unit of time, is connected with a physical movement of the hand. Here is one of the ways in which it was defined in an early 16th century German treatise. Tactus is a successive motion in song, directing the measure equally, or it is a certain movement formed by the lead singer according to the meaning of the signs which directs the song in a measured manner. In other sources, we learn that the tactus is often beaten with a vertical movement of the hand, but could also have been marked by tapping the fingers on various objects, or even on the backs or heads of your colleagues, or other ways. But regardless of how it was done, this motion was needed, as explained by this Bohemian treatise. It is necessary to show the tactus by perpetual motion. Otherwise, the singers would soon depart from the measure and the music would be discordant. Indeed, when reading from separate parts, as was the norm in this period, the presence of a clear beat plays an important role in singing together. The same writer, however, adds that skilled singers are accustomed to sing without the motion of the hand. A few decades later, the Italian Lodovico Zacconi referred to the determination required of those who beat the tactus. The duty of those who control the tactus is to make it clear, secure, without fear and without any hesitation. And even if, for the beauty of the song, the singers sometimes slow down somewhat, he must not pay attention to that slowing down, but attend to his duty. Because if he waits with the tactus until the singer has finished the sound, he will slow down in every tactus since singers always take the license to produce the note after the beat, to make it sound more attractive. Zacconi also noted that in cases where the composer or maestro di cappella are absent, one of the experienced singers should take the responsibility of beating the tactus. Another Italian author from the same period, Luigi Zenobi, describes more generally the necessary skills of a musical leader without mentioning the physical action of time beating. 1. They should be experts in simple and artful counterpoint, both written and sung, that is, improvised. 2. They should have a ready, quick and well-trained ear, so as to anticipate in a certain way anyone about to lose their part, rather than waiting for them to lose it. This seems to be an important skill as Zenobi doesn't refer to the leader as director or maestro, he refers to them instead as the rimetitore, the one who puts back those who went astray. 3. For this reason, they should have a voice that ranges with ease from high to low, which would allow the rimetitore to help any part that loses its way, not an easy task when singing from separate parts. Throughout the 16th century, there are numerous sources that criticize the way the tactus is given, complaining about unsightly gestures or marking the tactus with a stamping foot. One theorist even complains about those conductors who imitate a swan when leading music. Just as he sings with a bent neck, they stoop over while singing. The Spanish writer Juan Bermudo laments that some, forgetting that they are in the presence of God, beat on a book with a stick, so that the noise can be heard throughout the church. I can hardly bring myself to mention others who clap their hands to keep time. 
Joachim Burmeister also criticized the unnecessary gestures of singers and stated that the more modest the motion is, the more elegant it is and the more pleasing an appearance the singer will achieve. The aforementioned use of a stick when directing of course reminds us of the modern conducting baton. Here is a vivid description of one used by a nun when directing a group of 20 or so musicians. The maestro of the band is the last to sit down at one end of the table, holding a long, slender and polished stick, and when she is clearly satisfied that all the other sisters are ready, without any noise she gives them a signal to begin, and then carries on beating the time that they need to follow while singing and playing. Otherwise, there are many depictions of baton-like sticks, but we should be aware that these were also used to beat time audibly, to point out notes on the book, and even for disciplining naughty singers. As we can read in the sources and see in the abundant iconographical material, having the Maestro di Cappella or one of the singers beat the tactus seems to have been a common practice, even in small groups. But was it solely for the purpose of keeping time, like a living metronome? Before going on, let's look at a very interesting source that suggests otherwise. In this description of Orlando di Lasso as a musical director, we see that his leadership went further than merely beating the time. His lofty intelligence, combined with great firmness and artistic understanding, keeps the time precise and steady when they sing, so that like bold warriors taking courage at the sound of the trumpet, the expert singers under this influence draw energy and strength for putting forth voices that are lively, sweet, and sonorous. By the way, this is as good a time as ever to note that directors in the 16th century mostly didn't use scores in front of them when leading a performance. In church, they usually just had the choir book with all the individual parts, or otherwise just their own individual part to read from. Towards the end of the 16th century, the genre of polychoral motets started to develop, in which different choirs, groups of musicians, were situated in different locations throughout the church, and a way to effectively synchronize them became even more necessary. Let's see how it was done. In 1639, a Frenchman entered the church Santa Maria Sopra Minerva in Rome, and described how a polychoral motet was performed. The master composer beat time in the first choir, consisting of the best voices. With each of the others, there was a man who did nothing but keep his eyes on the main beat, synchronizing his beat with it, so that all the choirs sang together without dragging. On this title page of a publication from earlier in the century, we can see what seems like a similar situation. The time beater next to the big organ might be the maestro, with two time beaters, each next to another choir, synchronizing their movements. As mentioned before, scores were not commonly used by musical leaders. In 1612, Viadana explains how his polychoral pieces may be directed. The maestro di cappella shall stand with this five-voice choir, always looking at the organist's basso continuo part to see what course the music is taking and to give directions for when one person is meant to sing alone, when two, when three, when four, and when five. And at ripieno sections, when all the voices and instruments are performing together, he shall turn to face all the choirs, raising both hands as a sign for everyone to sing together. That is, the basso continuo part of Viadana's pieces in this collection and not a score, held all the information the leader needed to safely lead the piece. Some years later, Pretorius describes the same practice, and further adds that by reading from the basso continuo part, the director will have the piece in its entirety before him, and that this will not only enable him to be aware of a change in the beat to triple meter or something else, but also assist him in cueing the various choirs. Later in the century, we have evidence of German directors copying music into tablatures and using them to sing and conduct. 
The advantage of the German tablatures, especially in the case of those big polychoral pieces, is that while preserving the notes played by all the parts, one sheet of paper can hold a lot of music. For example, here you can see half of Hieronymus Praetorius's Dixit Dominus for 12 voices. It doesn't include the text, but it shows when each choir enters, when everyone is singing together, and when there are meter changes. While we are in the church, we must mention the rare yet ingenious device that allowed organists to conduct the singers while playing. I think it is at the Cathedral of Peterborough, where there is a wooden hand fixed on one side of the chair organ, by directing of which the organist gives the time to the singers, a very useful contrivance in order to keep them all together, it being impossible to be done without it and much better than the organist's beating time with his foot, as if he was hammering, as I have very often heard. Such a device is mentioned, albeit derogatively, in at least one other source, and can even be seen today in Ripon Cathedral in the UK, where the late 17th century device was installed on this 19th century organ. Since we are in England, before finishing this segment, have a look at this image of the English composer John Blow in the coronation of 1685, beating time to both the choirs. Notice the long stick. After visiting the churches in Italy, Germany and even England, let's see what happened in the Italian and French operas of the 17th century. While in many places it was the norm to have a conductor, especially with large or distant musical forces, in Italian opera, from its birth around 1600 and until the mid-18th century, there was generally nobody specifically beating time. Most often, the operas were led by the composer harpsichordist, or sometimes by the leading violin player. In Il Corrago, an early treatise on the subject from around 1630, emphasis is put on the fact that time beating is usually not used in recitative for several reasons. 1. The actor sometimes needs to lengthen or shorten some notes according to the affect, and he must not be bound by any rule of others, but freely go along with the impetus of the affects. 2. For the time beating to be effective, it must be seen both by the singers and players, and thus will be seen also by the audience which is a great inconvenience, since they have to stare at those very distracting ups and downs for two or three hours. 3. If the singers and players feel unsafe without a conductor, they should rehearse, since even with the conductor they are likely to make mistakes due to their insecurity. The writer does allow the use of a conductor only in those places where it is absolutely necessary. In Paris, more or less in the same period, we are told that those who direct musicians nowadays mark the time with the movement of the neck of the lutes or the orbos. It is of no consequence how the time is marked, provided it is enough to direct the singers to sing with precision. In engravings depicting performances of operas in the French court in 1674, we see slightly different practices. In this one, in a performance of the opera Alceste by Lully, we see the orchestra divided into two boxes and the time beater on the left waving his hand with a little paper roll, the one object that became associated with conducting and with the musical director in general. In this one, in the opera ballet La Grotte de Versailles by Lully, we see the orchestra again divided into the two sides of the stage led by a conductor waving two rolls of paper. And in this one, in the Comédie Ballet Les Malades Imaginaires by Charpentier, we see the conductor in the middle, very similar in fact to a modern conductor, again only with a roll of paper. By the way, since we mentioned Lully, you might have heard about the story of how in the heat of the moment he struck himself on the toe with the stick he was using to beat it. Traditionally, this has been understood to describe a style of conducting, where the leader beats the ground with the stick. But some speculate that this was just on this particular occasion, 
and that it was perhaps even just a rehearsal. Staying in France, Saint Lambert described the physical gestures of the time beater in a rather poetic way. He wrote that the movements should be perceptibly and distinctly marked, and that the hand must dance, so to speak, and represent for the eyes a picture of the rhythm that the ear needs to hear. But the first beat of each measure must be still more marked than the others. On this note, while many sources refer to simple vertical motion, some sources from the second half of the 17th century begin to suggest combining also horizontal movements, some of which are not so far from the established movements of modern conducting. And now, let's dive into the time beating in 18th century Germany. In a publication from 1720 dedicated to engravings of musical instruments and their players, a musical director is also included. Under it there is a little poem. It is I who lead and guide the tuneful choirs here. Indeed, I am silent myself, yet I create a loud sound. I do but raise my arm, and lo, immediately you hear tones that enchant our flesh and edify our soul. Notice the details. The papers next to him say a motet for two choirs, the kind of piece where such a director is required. Notice also that he is looking at a full score, which by this point was probably standard practice for directors. The rector of the Thomas Schule in Leipzig in the 1730s left us a colorful description of Johann Sebastian Bach as a musical director. He was amazed seeing him not only singing with one voice and playing his own parts, but watching over everything and bringing back to the rhythm and the beat out of 30 or even 40 musicians, the one with a nod, another by tapping with his foot, the third with a warning finger giving the right note to one from the top of his voice, to another from the bottom, and to a third from the middle of it, all alone. At more or less the same time, Johann Matheson, in his treatise dedicated to musical direction, seems to support Bach's way of directing while singing and playing. I have always fared better when I have played as well as sung along, rather than merely standing there to give the beat. The choir is much more encouraged, and one can urge people on much better. Concerning the physical gestures themselves, he was much against ineffective thrashing, clattering and pounding with sticks, keys and feet. He wrote, I am of the opinion that a little sign, not only with the hand, but with no more than eyes and gestures, could accomplish most things, if all the eyes are just kept firmly on the person in charge. The contemporary Johann Adolf Scheibe agreed that time beating shouldn't include stamping the feet clumsily and noisily, which, like Matheson's text, confirms that such practice took place. He suggested that it is sufficient for him to strike the beat loudly once or twice at the beginning of a movement, and then to show it through to the end by means of a moderate motion of the hand. If he can eventually accustom his forces not to need the former at all, and to be guided solely by the letter, so much the better. Above all, he himself must try as far as possible to avoid striking the beat in performance. What he describes can be heard in lots of popular music today, who of course don't need a conductor at all. Another source, written by the violinist and composer Francesco Maria Veracini, even describes the following. When the composer sits at the harpsichord to direct a composition of one kind or another, after having said one loudly, he should begin beating in a visible way with his body and with perceptible foot tapping, until the orchestra is fully united in the tempo he wants. Again, this reminds us of another modern practice. Okay, a one, two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> Regarding the best instrument from which an orchestra should be led, there are two main opinions. Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, the son of Johann Sebastian, reported that his father played the violin cleanly and penetratingly, and thus kept the orchestra in better order than he could have done with the harpsichord. Interestingly, 
In his own treatise, Carl Philipp nevertheless described the harpsichord as the best instrument from which to lead the music, stating that even average performers can be held together simply by its tone, provided that it is placed in the center of the ensemble with the first violin standing by it. On the other hand, musicians like his colleague, Johann Joachim Kvantz, preferred the first violin player to lead the performance, due to its aforementioned penetrating qualities. Another German source from later in the century describes very nicely how an orchestral performance may be the fruit of a collaborative effort, without a single director. The composer at the keyboard gives the tempo to the bass player and first violin, and together they hand it on to the rest of the orchestra. He also wrote that where an orchestra is arranged so that its members can all see and hear one another, where the composer has included performance indications in the parts, and where there are sufficient rehearsals, then no further direction is necessary. The piece plays itself like a clock that has been wound up and set running. While in Italy and Germany directors were often also playing, either keyboards or the first violin, in France the practice of time beating remained prominent. We hear of many sources saying derogatively that the French sometimes beat time audibly throughout complete operas. You can check the footnotes for some examples. But to finish this episode, let's see how in the 1730s in London, Georg Friedrich Händel chose to lead his oratorios. In a letter from 1738, written by a friend and librettist of Handel, Charles Jennens, we are told that Handel commissioned a special and expensive new organ. This organ is so contrived that as he sits at it, he has a better command of his performers than he used to have, and he is highly delighted to think with what exactness his oratorio will be performed by the help of this organ so that for the future, instead of beating time at his oratorios, he is to sit at the organ all the time. This organ seemed to have included a device, now known as long movement, that transfers the action of one keyboard to another instrument situated further away from it. With it, we think, Handel could sit at his harpsichord in the center of the orchestra, having good eye contact with the players play and lead the recits and arias, and then, in the big tutti choirs, activate the device that would make the keyboard of the harpsichord operate the organ situated in the back. Sadly, very little is known about Handel's use of this device, but in the extravagant events commemorating him in 1784, a similar instrument was definitely used. From this event, we have an engraving, a diagram of the orchestra, and plenty of written reports. You can see how the keyboard is at the center of the orchestra, operating the organ which is higher and further away. The lead singers, as was always the case, were at the front of the gallery and were guided by what they heard from behind them. According to one witness, the keyboard was brought near the front of the orchestra, by which means he could see the whole band, and they could see him, and had no time beater, which is a terrible eyesore, but was wholly conducted by the motion of his head or his holding up a hand. And it was the wonder of the world that a band consisting of 500 performers should go more perfectly together than ever was heard before. The famous writer Charles Burney added, foreigners, particularly the French, must be much astonished at so numerous a band moving in such exact measure, without the assistance of a choir director to beat the time, either with a roll of paper or a noisy button. This was our episode about historical conducting in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. We hope you enjoyed it. Many thanks to Tim and Lisandro for writing this episode together with me. Don't forget to check the especially extensive footnote page with all the full texts and other extra information. If you enjoy early music sources, consider supporting it on Patreon. Comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.